Hi guys, <clears throat> it is another smoky, hazy day here in what should be <clears throat> a beautiful, deep blue sky here in paradise, in the collapse of global industrial civilization, somewhere in the green mountains of Vermont here on this hazy Wednesday morning, July 10th. 2019 as I sit here you know just, just getting more and more depressed about thinking there there from here on out guys there's nowhere to run and hide you know from the wildfire smoke and the hurricanes and the droughts and the you know something is gonna get you but I cannot believe I am sitting here under a blanket of wildfire smoke uh, in the green mountains of Vermont, actually thinking that there was somewhere left, uh, you know, to, to try to squeeze a few more years out uh, before it, 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 it all comes down. It is coming down. It has come down. Anyway, uh, so that little why may or may not have something to do with this story. I think four of my Alert Tribes members have now sent me this story from Mother Jones, which I will put the link on here. This is a long, involved story. Not sure I'm going to get to all of it. I will put the link on to it uh, so you can... Just go read it yourself. To uh, and, and there's been stories like this before, and this is the latest update uh, from Mother Jones on this thing, where they've interviewed climatologists. You know, p people who spend their entire lives studying what is unfolding in real time behind, before our very eyes as this entire planet collapses to see uh, <clears throat> how they're feeling about it all. Here in Mother Jones, the newest update, story by David Korn. <clears throat> it is the end of the world as they know it. The distinct burden of being a climate scientist. <clears throat> On election night 2016, Kim Cobb, a professor at the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech University, was on Christmas Island, the world's largest ring-shaped coral reef atoll about 1,300 miles south of Hawaii. A climate scientist <coughs> She was there collecting coral skeletons to produce estimates of past ocean temperatures. She had been thinking these sorts of research, she had been taking these sorts of research trips for two decades, and over recent years, she had witnessed about 85% of the island's reef system perish due to rising ocean temperatures. Quote, I was diving with tears in my eyes, she recalls. <clears throat> in a row ho in a row house, a row house made of cinder blocks on the tiny island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, she monitored the American election results using a satellite uplink that took several minutes to load a page. When she saw Donald Trump's victory, she felt shock and soon descended into severe depression. Quote, I had the firm belief that Washington would act on climate change and would be acting soon, the 44-year-old Cobb says. When Trump was elected, it came crashing down. Yes. Back home in Atlanta, Cobb entered what she now calls, quote, an acute mental health crisis. Most mornings, she could not get out of bed despite having four children to tend to. 
And it just makes me wonder at what point, anyway, I'm not going to get off on, on, on my old saw. Anyway, moving on with the mother of four's acute mental health crisis. <clears throat> yes. Dee Dee. She would sob spontaneously, so would I if I had four kids. She obsessed about the notion that the U.S. government would take no action to address climate change <coughs> and confront its consequences. Quote, I could not see a way forward. My most resounding thought was, how could my country do this? I had to face the fact. There was a veritable tidal wave of people who do not care about climate change and who put personal interest above the body of scientific information that I had contributed to. I did not recognize myself. Her depression persisted for weeks. Okay. <clears throat> from Atlanta to California. Nine months after the Trump election, Priya Shukla, <clears throat> a PhD student at the University of California at Davis, who studies how climate change affects shellfish aquaculture and coastal food security, was in Bodega Marine Laboratory examining data showing how rising acidity, ocean acidity caused by greenhouse gas emissions. She was also binge leading, binge listening to the podcast S Town, which focused on an eccentric and troubled man prone to obsessing, ranting, really. An old man ranting. Imagine an old man ranting? Huh. About the possible apocalyptic effects of climate change. An old man prone to ranting about the possible apocalypse. There you go. <clears throat> Shukla, 27, year, 27 years old, realized she was, quote, emotionally exhausted by the toll of constantly scrutinizing the, quote, huge tragedy happening in the oceans. Quote, I did not want to experience that fatigue because then I would not want to do this work anymore. Close quote. She decided to see a therapist and these days, she sometimes has to stop reading scientific papers. <coughs> Quote, I am tired of processing this incredible and immense decline, and I am a contributor to the problem. I have to walk away from these papers and don't want to face myself in the mirror. I feel profound sadness and loss. I feel very angry, close quote. It does not mention how many kids this woman has. <clears throat> it's hardly surprising that researchers who spend their lives exploring the dire effects of climate change might experience emotional consequences from their work. Yet, Increasingly, Cobb, Shukla, and others in the field have begun publicly discussing the psychological impact of contending with data pointing to a looming catastrophe, dealing with denialism and attacks on science, and observing government inaction in the face of climate change. This is Christine Arena, uh, executive producer from Let Science Speak, uh, which featured climate researchers speaking out against efforts to silence or ignore science. Quote, scientists are talking about an intense 
mix of emotions right now. There is deep grief and anxiety for what is being lost, followed by rage at continued political inaction, and finally, hope. Finally, hope that we can indeed solve this challenge. There are definitely tears and trembling voices. <coughs> they know this deep truth. They are on the front lines of contending with the fear, anger, and perhaps even panic the rest of us will have to deal with. Close quote. Well, the rest of us who don't get out of here just in time. <clears throat> While Americans feel what you, this, yeah, yeah. While Americans feel what they describe, quote, as an increasing alarm about climate change, according to a survey conducted by the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, scientists have been coping with this troubling data for decades, and the grinding emotional effects from that research are another cost of global warming that the public has yet to fully confront. Before you ask, before you ask, there is no scientific consensus regarding the impact of climate research on the very scientists performing it. It has not been studied in a systematic way. But in one study two years ago, which I remember reporting on, Leslie Head and Teresa Harada, two geography scientists in Australia, published a paper examining <coughs> emotional management strategies used by a sample of Australian climate scientists. Head and Harada found that daily immersion in the subject caused anxiety for the scientists, exacerbated by the difficulty of, quote, protecting the psyche from the subject matter of climate change. The scientist's thinking was more often pessimistic than optimistic, and they tended to use diverse, distracting practices to separate themselves from their emotions. They generally said they enjoyed their work, but Head notes that, quote, it is hard to imagine it's not something that could cause manifestations <clears throat> down the track. For the, for the most part, these academics are well established in their jobs and already have demonstrated resilience in a competitive system, but you cannot help but wonder what the burden is doing to people that may or may not be visible, close quote. Are scientists then <coughs> canaries in a psychological coal mine? Is understanding their grief important because their anxiety could become more widespread within the general population? Head explains, that's why I chose them as a research sample. Put another way, climate scientists often resemble Sarah Connor of the Terminator franchise, who knows a looming catastrophe but must struggle to function in a world that does not comprehend what is coming and worse, largely ignores the warnings of those who do. Quote, an accurate representation of the Connor comparison, one scientist darkly notes, would have more crying and wine. Yes. So, what is it like 
to be cursed with foreknowledge that others ignore. Peter Kalmus, who received his BA and PhD from Harvard and Columbia respectively, spent about a decade working in astrophysics. He then moved to ecological forecasting based on satellite data and something shifted for him. Quote, this is quoting Peter Kalmus, studying earth scientists, studying earth science and thinking about climate change is a totally different ball game than thinking about astrophysics. Astrophysics was pure science. I was looking for gravitational waves. It had no impli implication for the possible collapse of human civilization. Close quote. But the unrelenting momentum of climate change does. Quote, I am always thinking about it. That can be a burden whenever friends talk about flying off to vacation, I feel compelled to point out the large carbon cost to flying. I would like to take a vacation from thinking about it. I'm not sure that is psychologically possible." Close quote. During the recent wildfires in California, where he lives, Kalmus became irritable because the link between natural disasters and climate change was not front and center in the media coverage. Like many climate scientists, he is often hit by waves of grief. Kalmus once called his congressional representative to support a piece of climate change legislation. Quote, I was explaining to the staffer why it was urgent, and I started crying. For me, the grief comes up unexpectedly. Close quote. <clears throat> Sarah Meyer, a former senior associate at the University of Washington School of Oceanography, experiences what she calls, quote, a profound level of grief on a daily basis because of the scale of the crisis that is coming. And I feel I'm doing all I can, but it's not enough. I don't have clinical depression. I have anxiety exacerbated by the constant background of doom and gloom of science. <laughs> there you go. It's not stopping me from doing my work, but it is an impediment." Close quote. Meyer tried anti-anxiety medication, which did not improve things, so she cut back on caffeine. Yes, maybe that's what I need to do is cut back on caffeine and increase my alcohol intake. She tries not to think too much about the future that awaits her five-year-old son. She tries not to think too much about the future that awaits her five-year-old son Okay, so that means that six years ago, this uh, climate, Sarah the climatologist, with the information she had six years ago, decided, oh well, why don't I have a child to, uh, to get my mind off the looming catastrophe that awaits all the unborn children. But anyway, I'm running off on a side rant. <clears throat> when she was a graduate student in 2010, <clears throat> Meyer, Meyer recalls, she attended a summer program that, in, that included the world's top scientists on climate modeling. <clears throat> One presented research on how increased CO2 levels posed frightening scenarios. 
She asked him how he was able to talk to non-scientists and communicate the implications of his work, which can be hard to understand. <clears throat> Quote, I don't talk to those people anymore, she remembers him replying, Doot, those people. Yes, this is a family show. Screw those people. After that, Meyer went to her hotel room and wept. As she saw it, his anger was driven by the fact that his expertise, his foresight, was not broadly recognized. Quote, people don't know what to do with their grief, and it is manifested in anger. <clears throat> and of course, I guess it was three years after that that Sarah decided it was time to bring a child onto the planet. <clears throat> okay, let's go over to Maine. Jacqueline Gill, a paleontologist at the University of Maine who co-hosts a podcast on climate change called Warm Regards, says she is, quote, not depressed, but angry all the time. And anger can be empowering or debilitating. I swing between both. Being constantly angry is exhausting. Tell me about it, uh, Jacqueline. But, she adds, it takes a certain resilience to be a scientist in America. Quote, there are so few jobs, so few grants, you're always dealing with rejection. You have to have a built-in ability to say, dude, it. Okay, guys, I am uh, only halfway through this. We're going, uh, good Lord, uh, we're going to hear from a couple of more folks and, uh, and wrap it up. Okay, let's hear from Katherine Wilkinson, who has a PhD in geography and the environment, is vice president for communication and engagement in Project Drawdown, a group of scientists and activists that assemble proposed climate change solutions. That, that must be a small assembly. She makes a distinction between denialism and what she calls bystanderism, which takes the form of people saying they care about it, but not engaging in meaningful action. Yes, bystand. I guess maybe I'm guilty of bystanderism because I'm still waiting to hear about some meaningful action other than not bringing more children into this looming disaster. Anyway, they care about it, but do not engage in meaningful action. That's when I want to shake people and say, you know how little time we have? Hmm. That'll, that, that'll work. There is some action. Shake people and tell them how little time we have. She has noticed that almost everyone in her line of work seems, quote, to have one dark emotion that is dominant. For some, it is anger or rage. For me, it is deep grief. Having eyes wide open to what is playing out in our world. And we have a lukewarm response to it. There is no way for me not to have a broken heart most days. Close quote. But let's, uh, I mean, as I say, guys, this goes on and on. But we're, let's check in with Eric Holthaus, 
Eric has just politely been ignoring my uh, invitations for a conversation on Collapse Chronicles. Uh, apparently, Eric has nothing to say to us, but he didn't mind talking to Mother Jones, I guess. For several years, <clears throat> Eric Holthaus, a meteorologist turned journalist, has written about his own efforts to contend with climate change induced depression. Quote, I lose sleep over climate change almost every single night. I can't remember how long this has been happening, but it has been quite a while and it's only getting worse. I confess I need help. Close quote. Holfaus went to see a counselor and as he put it, the therapist, quote, seemed unprepared for my emotional crisis. His simple advice was, do what you can, close quote. And, and guys, I, I might have Eric mixed up with somebody else, but I think Eric Holfaus Someone please correct me if I'm either right or wrong. Uh, I believe that Eric Holfaus was one of several climatologists who brought a child onto the planet uh, last year. So I guess that was Eric Holfaus taking his uh, shrink's advice deal with your emotional crisis about climate change by breeding. I'm not sure, <clears throat> Eric, if I accused you of being a breeder when you're not, I deeply apologize to you, brother. I would never insult a non-breeder by calling them a breeder. But anyway, guys, this, is, this goes on and on and on. Let's jump down to the last a uh, couple of paragraphs to wrap up. Good Lord, this is a novel. Okay, here is the bottom line to this, and you can get the link and read all of the, the middle two-thirds that I did not have time to get to. <clears throat> but... The, here, here comes the hopium and all this, I guess. Why I, I, you know, I had to find out where the hopium was. But, gotta love that word, but the despair experienced by scientists might have a benefit. Quote, this is Christine Arena, uh, who I guess is someone they interviewed earlier. Don't know who Christine is. Quote, more scientists are bringing their emotions and hearts to the forefront of their work, getting bolder, more impassioned, more provocative. In a way, this collective grief is making their outreach more effective, close quote. And Catherine Wilkinson, that's someone else they introduced in the part I didn't get to. Catherine Wilkinson points out, quote, Right now, we prioritize technical training in science and policy, but the tools of the trade will become increasingly emotional and psychological. Close quote. At a recent panel discussion, she recalls, she blurted out, quote, I have no child. Thank you, Catherine Wilkinson. I have no child, and I have one dog, and I thank God he will be dead in 10 years. Close quote. Afterward, People asked Wilkinson if she truly believed that. Quote, the truth is, I do. And it's only going to get more intense, the emotional nature of this work, 
as climate change happens and the necessary actions become more urgent. No child and one dog. And uh, anyway, my little fur baby is not having a good day. Uh, yes, Sancho Panza. But anyway, guys, I need to uh, wrap up today's chronicle of the collapse on this washed out smoky day in paradise because I need to go meet up with a tiny house builder uh, as I think of how I am going to deal with my own rage and grief before it all comes crashing down around us. And I highly suggest you get out there in the wildfire smoke while you still can. Bye, guys.